So today we are looking at chapter two, section 2.1, inductive reasoning. So first let's talk about what is inductive reasoning. In inductive reasoning, we go from observation. So this is going from observation to a general conclusion. A conclusion drawn using inductive reasoning aims at probability not certainty. So probability that something will happen. The inductive reasoning can result to a false conclusion even if all the premises in a statement are true. Inductive reasoning does not guarantee the, the conclusions to be logically correct. So let's look at an example of inductive reasoning. <clears throat> It says, John leaves for school at 7 a.m. John reaches school on time. John assumes that if he leaves at 7 a.m., he will always reach school on time. This statement is an example of inductive reasoning. The drawback of inductive reasoning is its failure in supporting conclusions Drawn with real life scenarios. So remember up here where we said that the inductive reasoning could lead to a false conclusion. Okay. So an example of a false conclusion here. John leaves for school at 7 a.m. He reaches school on time. He assumes if he leaves at 7 a.m. he will always reach school on time. This does not take into account what happens if he runs into road construction on the way? What happens if he gets a flat tire or he runs out of gas? What happens if there's an accident? What happens if he's involved in an accident? These are all things that could happen even if he left for school at 7 a.m. that would prevent him from being on time. So let's get some terms to know some of our definitions. So inductive reasoning, this is when you find a pattern. Okay. So when you find a pattern, in specific cases, and then write a conjecture and write a conjecture for the general case. we need to know what does the word conjecture mean. So that's our next definition. A conjecture is an unproven statement so an unproven statement based on observations. So an unproven statement based on observations is a conjecture. And we want to talk about what a counterexample is, and this is a specific case for which the conjecture is false. So our example of <clears throat> leaving for school at 7 a.m., getting to school on time, okay, that is our <clears throat> conjecture because we have noticed a pattern, an observation. We have seen that he leaves for school at 7, he gets to school on time. The counterexample or the numerous examples that I gave that could stop that from happening. So he leaves at 7 a.m., he gets a flat tire, he doesn't get to school on time. So that would be a counterexample is that he got a flat tire and therefore did not make it to school on time even though he left at 7. So let's look at another example. <clears throat> so example one, you notice that Mr. Carter has worn the same purple shirt every Monday for the first four weeks of school. <laughs> so the conjecture, Mr. Carter will wear a purple shirt on Monday.
inductive reasoning is being used since this is really only an observation. This is an observation, not necessarily a fact. So a counterexample. So a counterexample that would prove our conjecture false is Mr. Carter. Wears a, let's say, a blue shirt on Monday. So as long as Mr. Carter wears any color shirt except for purple on Monday, that would be a counterexample. So example number two, we're going to make up an example. So let's say Nash observed the first five students getting on the bus. For wearing jeans. So Nash observed the first five students getting on the bus were wearing jeans. What conjecture could we <clears throat> draw from that observation? So our conjecture would be the next student to get on the bus. is wearing jeans. And then it says, why does this example apply inductive reasoning? Because it's based on an observation of a pattern. So it's based on observation of a pattern. So now we need a counterexample. <clears throat> so our counterexample, the next student, get on the bus let's say is wearing a dress any counter example here would be anything that the next student that gets on the bus is wearing besides jeans so maybe the next student getting on the bus is wearing shorts maybe the next student getting on the bus is wearing sweats Maybe the next student getting on the bus is wearing pajamas. So lots of possible counterexamples there. Anything besides jeans would be a counterexample. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so those are some examples using words. Now let's look at inductive reasoning using numbers. Okay? So <clears throat> describe the pattern in the numbers. Write the next number in the pattern using your conjecture. So if you just look at this list of numbers, 1, 5, 9, 13. Our conjecture is going to be what pattern do we notice? So how can I get from a 1 to a 5? Well, I can add 4. Does that work each time? 5 plus 4 is 9. 9 plus 4 is 13. So that pattern works for 1, 5, 9, 13. So my conjecture, I could say, would be to add 4 each time. If that's my conjecture, then the next number, 13 plus 4, would be 17. So let's look at the next group of numbers, a 10, a 5, a 2.5, a 1.25. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm asking myself, how can I get from a 10 to a 5? I can subtract 5. 10 minus 5 is 5. Does that work each time? 5 minus 5 is 0. That's not the next number in the pattern. So that is not my conjecture. So what else could I do? How else could I get from a 10 to a 5? I could divide 10 by 2 and get 5. 5 divided by 2 is 2.5. 2.5 divided by 2, 1.25. So that works on this pattern. So my conjecture would be to divide by 2 each time. If I follow that pattern, the next number, so 1.25 divided by 2 is 0.625. Let's look at the next set of numbers. I have a 6, a 6, a 5, a 3, a zero, a negative four. Okay. So from a six to six, I don't have to do anything. To get from a six to a five, I can subtract one. To get to a five to a three, I subtract two. A three to a zero, I subtract three. A zero to a four, I subtract four. So let's see. First I was subtracting zero, then I'm subtracting one, then I'm subtracting two, three, four. So my conjecture 
and subtracting one more each time. That works on this pattern. So subtract one more each time. If I follow that pattern, then the next number I would subtract 5. So negative 4 minus 5 gets me negative 9 would be the next number in the pattern. Let's look at another one. The numbers are 2, 5, 11, 23, 47. What do I have to do to a 2 to get a 5? Well, I can add 3. Does that work each time? 5 plus 3, not 11. Okay. What if I added one more? So 5 plus 4, not 11. So what else could I do to get from a 2 to a 5? I could go 2 times 2 is 4. 4 plus 1 is 5. Does that work? 5 times 2 is 10. 10 plus 1 is 11. 11 times 2, 22, plus 1, 23. So that seems to be my pattern here of multiply by 2 and then add 1. If I do that, if I take 47 and I multiply by 2 and then I add 1, my next number would be 95. Our next example involves shapes. Okay. So this is the set that they give to me. I'm trying to write a conjecture or find a pattern. What do I observe? I have a triangle, a square, a pentagon, a hexagon. Okay. So these are all polygons. So what's special about them? Okay. I notice that they're all convex. Okay. So let's see. My triangle has three sides. My square has four sides. My pentagon, five sides. My hexagon, six sides. So my Conjecture is that I would increase the number of sides by one each time. So increase the number of sides by one each time. So my next shape is going to be a heptagon or a septagon, something with seven sides. So just anything with seven sides. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so... I just need a heptagon or a septagon. Remember, those are the two words for a seven-sided polygon. I just need something with seven sides. All right, example number five, the conjecture. If the product of two numbers is positive, then both original numbers were positive. Is that true or false? Well, let's see. It's false if I can find a counterexample. So can I come up with two numbers okay, that are not positive to start out with, but when I multiply them together, my answer is positive. Okay. Let's pick two negative numbers, right? That's the opposite of positive. What if I took negative 2 times negative 4? I would get a positive 8. So I just proved that conjecture false by providing a counterexample that I could take two negative numbers and multiply to get a positive. Any two negative numbers, it doesn't matter what my two negative numbers are, once I multiply them, I get a positive. So lots of possible counterexamples there. Okay. Let's look at example number six. We want to write a function rule or an equation relating x and y. So here our function rule, you did these in Algebra 1, is like our conjecture. This is an xy table. These are x's and y's. I didn't show it that well. Okay. okay, so the first one, my x's are 1, 2, and 3. My y's are 7, 9, and 11. So what did I have to do to the 1 to get a 7? I could add 6. So that, does that work each time? 2 plus 6 is not 9. So that doesn't work. What else could I do to a 1 to get a 7? So let's see, I could multiply 1 by 2. 1 times 2 is 2. What do I get from a 2 to a 7? I would have to add 5. Does that work each time? If I do 2 times 2, I get 4. 4 plus 5, 9. That works. 3 times 2 is 6. 6 plus 5, 11. So that works. So I'm multiplying by 2. I'm multiplying each x by 2. So that's 2x. And then I'm adding 5 to it. So the function rule, y equals 2x plus 5. That would be our conjecture. Next set, my x's are 1, 2, and 3. My y's are, one, are 3, 6, and 9. What can I do to a 1 to get a 3? I can add 2. Does that work? If I take 2 and I add 2, I'd get 4, not 6. Okay, so I go back to my 1 and 3. What else could I do to a 1 to get a 3? 
I can multiply 1 times 3 and get a 3. If I do 2 times 3, I get 6. 3 times 3 is 9. So the pattern I notice here is multiply my x's by 3. So y equals 3x is the function rule for the pattern conjecture. Okay, so this next one, what conjecture can be made about the number of dots in the nth term of this pattern? So they give me four terms, and they're asking about n terms. So that could be like the 20th term, the 50th term. What do I notice? Okay, so I notice that term 1 okay, has two dots. Term 2 has six dots. Term 3 has 12 dots. Term 4 has 20 dots. Okay, so my term, this is going to be my n. What do I notice about the columns that I have? Okay, so my columns here, I have one, two columns here, one, two, three columns, one, two, three, four columns, one, two, three, five columns here. So I notice, I'm just writing down things that I notice, a pattern. So I notice the number of columns is one more than the term number, than the uh, number, okay? So now let's look at rows. Here I have one row. Here I have two rows. Here I have three rows. Here I have one, two, three, four. So the number of rows is the same as the term number. So I'm looking for my in rows okay, and my in columns. Okay. So what am I doing each time to my columns? I'm adding one. So my columns would be in plus one. But then what am I doing with the rows? They're staying in. So n times n plus 1 would get me the conjecture about the number of dots in the ninth, or sorry, in the nth term of this pattern. So I add 1 for my columns, n plus 1. I multiply that by the number of rows or the term number, and that's going to get me how many dots I have. Okay. All right. The next one, this is based on the data in the table, how many residents would you expect to vote in the 7th Town Council election? So they give me seven years, the total residents, and how many voters? Okay. I want to know what percentage okay, of my residents actually voted. So year number one, I had 386 voters out of 3,511 residents. So I'm going to divide that and I get 0.1099. In year two, I have 414 voters out of 3,790 residents. 0.1092. Kind of close there, isn't it? Number three, 451 voters out of 4,085 residents. That gets me 0.1104. Year number four, we had 544 voters out of 4,907 residents. When I divide that, I get 0 0.1108. Year number five, I had 623 voters out of 5,562 residents. And I divide that, I get 0 0.1120. Year 6, it's 767 voters out of 7,114, which gets me 0 0.1093. So what pattern do I notice? Okay. If I look at these, I have 0 0.1104, 0 0.1108, 0 0.1120. If I took the first one, 0 0.1099, and I rounded that, I'd be at 0.11. The next one, 0 0.1092, I could round that up to 0 0.11. And this last one, 0 0.1093, would also round up to 0 0.11. So I'm going to say my conjecture is that the number of voters is approximately 
of the residence. So if I use that conjecture, that pattern, therefore, year seven, I'm looking for what is 11%. So what is 11%, 0.1111 of, means multiply, my residence, 7,786. When I multiply that out, I get 856.46. So I would have approximately 856 voters in the seventh year. So now let's look at finding counterexamples that prove conjecture is false. So conjecture, I have a polygon with diagonals, has two fewer diagonals than sides. Okay. Well, let's just draw a polygon. Let's start with a quadrilateral. There's my quadrilateral. Remember that a diagonal is a line that goes from one vertex to um, the all other opposite vertexes. So I have one, two. So here I have four sides, two diagonals. Did I prove my conjecture false? It's two fewer diagonals than sides. No, that proved it true. So let's see, instead of four sides, what if I did five sides? Two, three, four, five. So I'm going to look at a pentagon. So five sides. If I draw all of my diagonals, so I across, down, across, down. And then I have this one can come here. Okay, so I end up with one, two, three, one, two, three, four, and five. So I ended up with five diagonals. So that just proved my conjecture false because a pentagon has five sides. But it also has diagonals. So it just takes one counterexample to prove it false. Okay? So therefore, that proves the conjecture false. All right. So now let's test the conjecture with several examples or find a counterexample to disprove the conjecture. A polygon with four congruent sides is a square. So, four congruent sides. Okay, it's a square, right angles. Okay, that's what it takes to make a square. I have to have four congruent sides and right angles, four right angles. Can I draw a polygon with four congruent sides that is not a square? Okay. Remember from earlier classes. So, here is a polygon, four congruent sides. These are not all right angles. This is known as a rhombus. See how much we remember from our previous years. So a rhombus has four congruent sides, but no right angles. Therefore, it is not a square. And proves the counter example, or sorry, proves the conjecture false. Let's do that again. So this one, if a number is a multiple of nine, then the sum of its digits is a multiple of nine. Let's see if we can prove this false. So let's get some multiples of nine. So I'm going to list multiples of nine here. And then the sum of its digits. chart here. So multiples of nine. So I'm just going to pick um, nine times. I'll start at five. So nine times five is 45. Okay. So the sum of its digits, so its digits are 45. So four plus five equals nine. Let's do nine times. Let's get really big. Let's do nine times 100. Nine times 100 is 900. The digits of 900, nine plus zero plus zero is equal to nine. Let's try a number between five and 100. Let's do nine and, oh, let's say 73. Nine times 73 is 657. 
657, the digits 6 plus 5 plus 7, so 6 plus 5 is 11, 11 plus 7 is 18. So the sum of its digits is also a multiple of 9. So I got 9, 9, and 18. These are all multiples of 9. So I have not come up with a counterexample. So I can say that my conjecture is true for the three cases I tested. So that is a look at section 2.1 inductive reasoning. Let me know if you have any questions.